I was 13 years old at the time, and in the 7th grade, so that puts us back in the year 2005. The spring season was coming to an end around this time, and in Washington, spring and summer are the only times one gets to enjoy the sun. Throughout fall and winter it's pretty much just heavy rain, day in and day out. Summers were notorious for thunderstorms though. It wasn't uncommon to wake up drenched in sweat and go to bed drenched in rain. Weather patterns in Washington state are the very definition of unpredictable. On this particular summer day, it was Saturday and my father and I decided to go fishing. We usually go fishing twice a month and we usually go to the same spot to do so. A massive lake surrounded by dense forest located only a few miles away from an Indian reservation. It was a beautiful lake and we loved being surrounded by all of the trees and wildlife, with no cities or major roads nearby. It made for nice, peaceful bonding experiences with my father. He had just returned from his first 365-day deployment to Iraq, so I was eager to finally spend a day with my old man again. The lake itself was surrounded by forest, with the region to the west running out into the Pacific Ocean. The region to the north led to the Indian Reservation. To the east was a small town, primarily consisting of Native Americans. Many of them from the reservation had set up shops in this town nearby, and to the south was an interstate that took you back to, well, civilization. With the exception of the occasional fellow fishermen strolling by, the lake was always desolate and eerily silent. After arriving to our usual fishing hole and unloading all of the poles, lures, and tackle boxes from the back of the Toyota pickup, everything was business as usual. The sun was out. It was about 1 p.m., and my father kept sharing stories of his experiences in Iraq while I continued to eagerly beg for more. We casted our lines, exchanged words, chewed some sunflower seeds, spit out the shells, reeled in the lines, and then moved on to a different story before recasting and repeating the whole process. I loved it. It was a ritual, a ritual only he and I got to have together. Minutes turned to hours, and before we know it, it's about 5.30 in the evening. We decided to pack it in because nightfall in that part of the state could arrive as early as 6 or 6.30 and we didn't want to be in the forest at night, primarily because of bears and wolves. Keep in mind, however, that it is still currently bright out, and the sun has only just begun to make its descent beyond the mountains. With more than enough daylight to pack up, my father starts reeling in all of the casts and breaking down the poles. I packed up the tackle boxes and lures and threw them into the pickup bed, Along with the coolers and snacks we had packed, the poles were the only things left to be loaded up, and then we would be ready to leave. I was about to tell my father that I was going to go take a piss real quick, and before I could even open my mouth, I caught a whiff of a smell that I can still remember clearly to this day. It was rancid. That's the best way to describe this stench. Absolutely fucking rancid. I have never smelled anything so terrible in my life. Do you smell that? I called out. What? replied my father. I figured it must have just been something blowing through in the breeze. Never mind. It smelled like a wet dog rolled around in its own shit, got hit by a truck, lied dead under a hot sun for two weeks, and then burst into some kind of maggot infested stench cloud. And that's just putting it politely. The odor stung my eyes. Dad, I'm gonna go pee real quick. I'll be back. He nodded and off I went, into the shrubbery to our usual piss spot. Oftentimes we will just pee anywhere, but because we had seen a few fishermen walk by a couple hours ago, I figured it'd be safer to just go piss in the trees. We usually pee behind this massive fallen tree that's roughly 50 yards into the woods. It's leaned at a perfect angle that provides total obscurity from the lakeside. The forest itself is thick enough to probably conceal me without the aid of the fallen tree, but somehow pissing behind this tree just became habit during the many visits we have made to this fishing hole in the past. As I'm taking care of business, 
The sky was suddenly enveloped in clouds in a matter of seconds. It was bizarre. There was still daylight, but it was more gray and toned down, as opposed to the sunlight you would get with a clear blue sky. It reminded me of a winter day, when the sun's presence seems completely absent. Then everything happened so fast. As I'm zipping up, I hear a tremendously loud crack right behind me. I'd say about 30 yards away based on its reverb. As I'm in the middle of turning around, my face is sprinkled with the light droplets that precede a heavy thunderstorm. I scan the area where I heard the sound but see nothing. My immediate thought was that it was just an old tree branch splitting off, which is common to hear in these woods. I hear it again, closer, but from a different direction. I would be a liar if I told you my heart wasn't racing like a motherfucker at this point. I could easily have just ran back to the fishing hole, but curiosity kept my feet glued. It was like knowing what made that sound was a prerequisite to concluding our fishing trip. After about two minutes of me standing there foolishly, and realizing that I'm getting drenched in the rain that is beginning to pick up, I chalk the noise up to thunder and turn around to head back to my father. Part of me was in denial, though. It wasn't a boom sound like thunder. This was a crack, like something big was being snapped in half. I took about three steps in the direction of the fishing hole when I heard the most bone-chilling sound that I have ever heard to this day. It sounded like a cross between a man screaming at the top of his lungs and, well, another man screaming at the top of his lungs. I know that might seem silly, but that's really how I remember it. It sounded like two men screaming in unison, with slightly different pitches in their voice. I didn't have time to think about where that dreaded noise came from. My ass was in high gear. I remember shortly after that noise from hell, I heard my father shout my name with obvious worry in his voice. I know he heard the sound as well, and probably thought it was me screaming, or thought it was an animal or something. As I'm sprinting in the direction of the truck, and making every effort to control my body's shaking, jumping over branches and logs and maneuvering between foliage, I suddenly hear, something is walking through the woods very close to me. Dad, was all I could manage to get out in between short breaths. And holy shit, I see it. I fucking see it. While sprinting forward, I see a dark mass in the far left of my field of vision growing. Everything was a blur, so I just assumed everything in the corner of my eyes were bushes and trees. And then I realized this isn't an immobile object that's growing. This is something that's coming closer to me. Getting bigger as the distance between us closes. Suddenly, it hit me that this approaching object was the source of the heavy footsteps. So I turned my head to the left and what I saw accelerated me to speeds that I would think are humanly impossible. Approaching me with tremendous speed was an ape-like creature with massive swinging arms. Those I remember the most. The arms were massive and long, almost lanky in the way they dangled, but very muscular. This creature was bipedal as all hell. You know how when you go to the zoo, you see monkeys and gorillas walking around with some assistance of their forearms? Kind of like tromping around on all fours, but occasionally using just two feet before using all four again? Yeah, not this thing. This creature was full-on striding towards me with its legs, while its arms were swinging lazily at its sides. My biggest fear was that all it had to do was reach out to grab me, because its arms seemed long enough to do that. This thing was so fucking close to me, and all I could focus on was going faster and faster. I recall the awful smell being present again. It was in full force. Just the worst stench anything on this planet could produce. I was too scared to care, but I definitely remember the smell being heavy. The final details I can recall from my brief glimpse at this demon was that it was easily about seven to eight feet tall and matted with thick brown fur. Very long fur, too. Its head was conical in shape. It seemed to narrow at the top, but from head to toe, 
This thing was matted in very long brown hair. I remember seeing bits of leaves and foliage stuck throughout the fur on its body too. I didn't dare try to make out facial details, although sometimes I wish I had. I couldn't see much of the face from my distance combined with my constant running, and at the time, I really didn't want to know what the fuck this thing looked like. Its body gave me more than enough fear for a lifetime. By this point, the rain is coming down heavy. Please don't slip, please don't slip. I must have screamed for my dad about a thousand times. I remember making a few attempts to scream, but nothing would come out because my throat was very raw and sore from the screaming I was already doing. I also remember thinking, why does it feel like my dad is so far away? The walk to the piss spot is a short one, and yet I swear I was running full speed for a good few minutes before I made it back. Fear does incredible things to your sense of time and space. As I approached the clearing and can make out the pickup truck, by some incredible grace of parental intuition, my dad pulls some very genius shit. I'm not sure what prompted him to do this, but as I'm approaching the fishing hole, I see him standing by the edge of the wood line, looking for me through the foliage. His truck is already on and running. His driver's side door is open and he's close to it, as if he knew that whatever was happening to me was going to involve a much needed quick escape. The truck was parked in a way where the driver's side was already facing the wood line I'm running out of, so I like to think we were dealt a good hand on this day. At the very moment we made eye contact, my dad turns around and hauls ass for the driver's seat. But not before shouting, Jump in the bed! Get in back! Hurry! I should note that this is only a two-seater pickup, so my options were to circle around the truck and get in the passenger door, or to jump in the bed. It's obvious which option is far less time-consuming. All I can think about is how happy I'm going to be to see the fucking interstate again. This thing is still following me and is now out of the woods and running on the dirt. Its footsteps are the only indicator of its presence, while my visual focus is purely on what's ahead. I remember quickly eyeballing the best point on the ground to jump from, to make it into the pickup bed smoothly. The shriek happened just as I made my leap of faith, and I would even go as far as to say that it terrified me so much in a way that it made my jump even stronger. I jumped like my life depended on it, and no sooner than my body made contact with the bed of the truck, my dad fucking floored it. I shifted around violently. I couldn't feel the vicious bruise my arm had taken when I landed on one of the tackle boxes. I couldn't feel the sharp ringing in my ear from the shriek of defeat the creature emitted. I couldn't feel the sting of the two fishing hooks that burrowed just beneath the skin of my right calf. I didn't care about anything. I only cared about going home. We've told family and friends of our encounter, but nobody ever seems to fully understand what we went through on that summer day. How can they? It's a terror that must be felt to be understood. They didn't see what we saw, but that's okay. I wouldn't wish such a sight on my own worst enemy. So a little backstory. I grew up in the suburbs of Philly in Pennsylvania. Somewhat rural and kind of normal suburbia. Sometimes when I was a kid, I would go to summer camp up in the Pocono Mountains. Lenape natives and the like populated them in the old days. So this happened when I went to Camp Watonka, the summer that I was 15 or 16 years old. The camp was doing manhunt, which all of the younger kids loved. It's essentially hide and seek mixed with tag done in the dark. Every kid was given a small flashlight and told to stay in groups of at least two. So being the fucks we were, me, a kid named Scott, and a kid named Eric went up to where our bunk was. Now I'm going to try to draw a really basic setup of the camp. Overall, there's the main camp that has most of the cabins. It's lower down than the lake where we swam and fished, and the older kids' cabin. I should say now that it was an all-boys camp. 
So Scott, Eric, and I go up to our bunk. No one else is there. It was all supposed to stay in the main camp. No one goes up to the lake area, and no one crosses the bridge into the woods. Not the trees, but on the opposite side, there was a bridge across a gorge that led into deep forestation. No one is really allowed in it past sunset. Makes sense. It's dangerous and kids are idiots. So the three of us are chilling on the steps up to the cabin. Then we see someone coming from the wooded area that rims the majority of the lake. This was weird because everyone, including the counselors and the other kids, were supposed to be in main camp, but also had no pathways into those woods. So they're around 50 yards away from us, just kind of hobbling towards us. Eric suggested that they could be hurt and we should help them, to which Scott said, fuck off. I said it's probably a counselor trying to scare us for not playing the nightly game. When he was around 10 yards out, we could see what he looked like, from the moonlight and the dimmish cabin lights. He looked like he'd been in a fight, like his nose was off, his cheeks must have been shattered, and his jaw was limp. He didn't really walk as much as stumbled eloquently. Scott later described his appearance as caveman got fucked by a gray, then dropped from the mothership, which fits well. So the three of us are making jokes about how it's a nice costume, and how he's an ugly fuck, etc. But when he was about ten feet away, we realized a few things. It reeked like blood. The fleshy iron tinge. It was just in the air. We also heard the canteen bell. That means everyone, and I mean everyone except us three, is down in main camp. Scott, Eric, and I run the fuck inside and lock the thin pine door. The thing walked up to the steps we'd been hanging out on. It just stood there. It easily could have broken the door and gotten to us, but it stood there probably for about 10 minutes. Then it shrieked. I've since read other skinwalker stories, and let me tell you, nothing matches that noise. Then it stopped and ran away, like swiftly and extremely fast. We stayed inside the cabin, too scared to leave. About three minutes later, I'm guessing, four of the head counselors came through the area on quads, each with a rifle. When they saw we weren't at canteen, they figured we were here, and then they heard the shriek. Apparently, they never crossed the bridge and only did stuff at night. I was told this by the older counselors later. They were testing the waters with us. Fucking scary, man. I never thought it would be the last time I saw my little sister. It started out as such a typical Friday afternoon. The bell rung, and we had the whole weekend to look forward to. We lived in a small town in Michigan. It was one of those towns where everyone knew everyone. One of those towns where you basically felt safe anywhere you went. We lived in a small split-level house. My little sister and I shared a bedroom and my parents were directly across the hall from us. Our house backed onto a deep, vast forest, and through the middle of the forest was a river. The woods always provided a sort of natural playground for the local kids, building tree forts, playing hide-and-go-seek, and swimming the more shallow parts of the river. My little sister and I felt especially lucky. The woods were essentially my backyard, and we really felt like they were ours. Our parents were fine with us playing in the woods, they just had one rule. Don't cross to the other side of the river. The woods on our side of the river were quite well traveled by all the locals. By age seven, you knew them like the back of your hand. The other side of the river, however, was much less traveled. It was our town's myth, kind of our own scary claim to fame. The Micmac tribe had largely settled the area around our town, so there were a lot of stories based on Native American culture. Everyone's favorite story was about the Wendigo. 
A Wendigo is a Native American legend, supposedly a half-man, half-beast type creature. The rumor is that, during a harsh Michigan winter, a member of the Mi'kmaq tribe and his hunting partner got caught during a blizzard. The tribe member's partner died, and with no food, the tribe member was forced to eat him. Native Americans believe that Wendigos are born when a member of their tribe is forced to resort to cannibalism due to harsh conditions, such as weather or a famine. And so legend was born, and people began to believe that a Wendigo hunted for more flesh in our woods. Everyone from here has a story that they would be having a campfire in the woods, and all of a sudden a deep, resonating roar would sound out through the forest. The belief around here was that the Wendigo would not hunt for you, as long as you stayed on your side of the river. The rest of the woods beyond the river belonged to him. As per usual Friday ritual, my friends and I filled our backpacks with our swim trunks, snacks, soda and other trinkets to spend the rest of the day playing in the woods. As we were leaving, my little sister came running out of the house. I was 13 and she was 9. She was begging to come spend the day in the woods with my friends and I. Normally I would say no, but it was such a beautiful day and she really was not much of a hassle to have along. So I said yes. There were four of us. It was three in the afternoon at the beginning of June, so we knew we would have daylight for quite a while. Off we went into the woods, taking the same trail that we took every time. The trail led us straight to the river, where we would set up a little camp and spend the rest of the day playing and swimming. A few hours rolled by and we were pretty tired. There was not much left to do, so I suggested that we pack up and head home. Now, 13 can be quite a rebellious age, the age where you start to disobey your parents, maybe act out in school here and there, try a cigarette, you know, pretty typical teen behavior. Let's cross to the other side of the river, one of my friends exclaimed. In my head, I knew this was a terrible idea. Growing up here, you barely have any rules to follow. Not going to the other side of the river was an explicit one. Yeah, I've always wanted to do that, my other friend said in agreement. In my head I knew this was a bad idea, but I also did not want to seem like a chicken in front of my friends. Well, okay, I said cautiously. My little sister looked at me. Her big blue eyes were full of fear. I reassured her, telling her that nothing bad would happen. And so, we began to walk to the point in the river where it was shallow enough to cross. We arrived, and I will be honest, the other side of the river looked like an entirely different world. It was darker. It honestly just had this entire unfriendly vibe to it. I brushed it off. It was about 7.30pm, and the sun was beginning to set in the sky. Though we still had plenty of daylight, we walked across the river. It was about ankle deep at this point, and the water was frigid here, a lot colder than it was where we were swimming. I put my foot down on the other side of the river. For the first time in my entire life, I had done what so many people who grew up here feared to do. Just standing there felt uneasy. It really felt like we did not belong there, but at the same time, there was that feeling of adrenaline pumping through my body, and it carried me as we walked deeper into the woods. My little sister was attached to my hip. I felt bad. She truly had no interest in being here, but also wanted to appear brave in front of my friends. As we got deeper into the woods, the feeling of dread increased. The weird part is, it was not what I could hear. It's what I could not hear. There was not a sound, not a cricket, not a bird, not even the river. It was silent, deadly silent. The trees seemed so much thicker in this part of the woods. Not as much sunlight came through, so it was definitely darker, not just my imagination. We heard a crack in the distance. Everyone gasped. I cannot reiterate enough that it was silent. There was not a single noise coming from anywhere. But then to hear that distinct crack, 
it made my heart skip a beat. Probably just a deer. There's tons of them in the woods, one of my friends stated. At this point, I wanted to turn back, but for some reason, we just kept going. The stories were echoing through my head about the Wendigo, about how foolish people over the years had dared to cross over to this side of the river, and how they were never seen again. As we continued to explore the uncharted parts of the woods, another crack this time came behind us. That one really startled everyone. We had all decided that it was time to head back. It was really starting to get dark. There was just one problem. This side of the woods was unfamiliar to us, and we were lost. My little sister began to cry upon realizing this. And while I was doing my best to settle her down, she was really scared, and I have to admit that I was too. The minimal light that was previously coming down from between the thick trees was now beginning to fade as the sun began to set. The darkness was becoming even darker, and we had not even thought to bring flashlights. The thought of Wendigo ran through my head time and time again, each time sending a sickening chill down my spine. We tried everything we could to find our way back to the shallow spot of the river, but it was to no avail. We could not even find the river to begin with. We heard a crack again from behind us, then a low rumble. A rumble that resonated through the trees. A gust of wind hit us from the side, knocking me back and knocking my little sister over. The rumble got louder, growing into much more of a roar. It's a bear, screamed one of my friends. Another gust of wind hit us, this time from behind. Run, I bellowed, and we all ran, leaving our backpacks behind. I had my little sister's hand in mine, essentially dragging her through the dirt and leaves on the ground. I could definitely hear something running, fast footsteps. They would be behind us, then beside us, then nowhere. It's the river, screamed one of my friends. We all stopped as we approached the river's edge. It was too dark to tell if it was shallow or deep at this point. The roar returned behind us and it was close. We have to jump in, I said. No, my two friends and my little sister screamed simultaneously. Fast footsteps approached, a low growl and multiple cracks as the predator approached us. Now, I screamed, and in we all jumped. The last thing I heard before my head sunk under the water was a roar. Inhuman and nothing like an animal. I knew what had just chased us, and I know how good of a hunter it is. My question to myself was, why and how are we still alive? The water was pitch black and it was deep. We were all strong swimmers and managed to find our way to the other side of the river. Our side of the river. Even in the dark, we were able to navigate this side and find our way back to the trail that led to my house. The whole walk back, all I could think was if Wendigo wanted us dead, we would be dead. Every legend about it speaks about how it is the best hunter and how once it tracks you, you are dead. We arrived back at my house to some very angry parents, scolding us. We all explained how we'd just lost track of time having too much fun playing in the woods. They bought all of our explanations. No way we were going to mention the fact that we went exactly where we had been told not to go our entire lives. I prepared myself for bed and went to lie down. It was hot this time of year, so my window was open. It was letting in a gentle breeze that felt quite nice. As I lie there, I hear the sound of the quick footsteps again, accompanied by the low rumbling. My palms began to sweat, and my heart dropped into my stomach. Had Wendigo tracked us back to our house? As slowly as possible, I turned the lever and closed my window, doing my best not to make a sound. My little sister was asleep on the bed parallel to mine, and I did not want her to hear any of this. I shut the window and flipped the latch to lock it. My parents were asleep, my little sister was asleep. I was the only one awake for this. I was under my covers, noticing every little sound my old house made, and then I heard it. The kitchen door was opening. It makes a distinct squeak when it opens. 
I began to shake. Wendigo had come. I could hear it moving. It knocked a glass over. The sound of fast footsteps below me. They became louder as Wendigo made its way up our staircase and to my bedroom door. The knob turned and Wendigo was inside my bedroom. I shook violently, my hands clammy, my stomach sick. I hid under my covers as I listened to the low rumble grow louder and louder with each footstep it took in my room. And then whoosh, the same sound it had made when it hunted us in the woods. The rumbling had stopped and the fast footsteps were gone. The sun shined brightly into my room the next morning and I hopped out of bed. I went downstairs to find my parents sitting in the kitchen, my dad reading the newspaper and drinking coffee, and my mom frying bacon for breakfast. Morning champ, you must have slept well after your big day yesterday, my dad said. He was right. It was 11 a.m and I rarely sleep past 9.30. The same for your sister, my mom said. Why don't you go wake her up, champ? I immediately ran upstairs to our room, and to this day, it is still the most horrific sight that I have ever laid my eyes upon. My little sister's bed was empty. Mom, Dad, come quick, I cried out. They both ran upstairs. Oh my God, where is she? My mom said. She was already beginning to cry. We looked everywhere, she was not in the house. My parents looked outside, and within an hour, a search party had formed. They searched the woods, top to bottom, but she was nowhere to be found. My parents believed that she had just wandered off into the woods in the morning, fell in the river, and drowned. But I knew why they could not find her. I knew why they would never find her. They were looking on the wrong side of the river. Hey guys and ladies, thanks for watching. Be good to animals, even people. See ya! Yo, Snemach, Barksmith, Hirsch. Hey, little shoes. Absolutely fucking rancid. The fuck's going on here? Summers were no. Summers were no. <laughs> Summers were notorious. Summers were notor- <laughs> Notorious, what the fuck? <clears throat>